Hi everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I am joined by Nigel Baker, Professor Emeritus of Moral Theology at the University of Oxford. On this episode, we had a conversation centered on his most recent book, Colonialism: A Moral Reckoning. I greatly enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. Professor Bigar, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. My pleasure, Rashid.、Uh, glad to be here and、uh, have a chance to chat about some important things. I came across your book for the first time a few months ago, and I finished reading it maybe a week or so after I bought it. And I was stunned because this is such an important book, and it is surprising for the fact that. This is not the most popular argument to be made these days in the academy as an understatement. As to my knowledge, the only person I remember making a similar book-less argument recently was Bruce Gilley. So I'm curious, why did you decide to write this book at this time? Yeah, Rishi, I'm glad that when you heard about the book, you were keen to read it because lots of people who hear about it are not keen to read it. <laughs> so frankly, I wanted to write this book for political reasons. There was a local reason here in the UK, namely, in 2014 we had a referendum on whether Scotland should separate itself from the UK. And I'm Anglo-Scottish, and I'm a, an instinctive unionist, anti-secessionist. I think the UK is a valuable multinational state, but I, I felt obliged to look at the. Arguments made by secessionists as to why Scotland should become independent, and one argument I came across was this: Britain equals empire equals evil, and for Scotland to break from the UK, for Scotland to cleanse itself of rubby, morally compromised imperial past, and to sail off into some new, bright, shiny, sin-free. Probably European future, and since I'd spent thirty years off and on reading about British imperial history, I knew that the simplistic equation "empire equals evil" just ain't true. But that was the point at which I realised that colonial history has political power, and in this case, was being used to support a cause that I regarded as, and still regard as, politically delusory and destructive. But more generally, I think, as I say in the book, that the interesting focus of a lot of folk on the left with European and British colonialism, not Chinese or Arab or Zulu or Comanche, but British colonialism. That's interesting because it's selective. And why is it selective? I think because the British Empire is a proxy for the West, and the record of the Empire is the record of the West. And what's going on here is, is an assault on the record of the West. And since I regard the West, we can talk about what that means. But I regard the West as worth defending, notwithstanding its many faults. And there are many things about the West of which I'm critical. Because I regard the West as worth defending, I wanted again. To explain the much more nuanced and morally ambiguous story about the British Empire. For me, growing up in the Caribbean, I was obviously exposed to a very particular view of the British Empire and a very particular view of colonial history. And upon reflection, I've come to realize that these imparted wisdom, or received wisdom. Isn't actually very accurate, and that really got me to think a bit harder about what I've I was taught. So, one of the main history books in the Caribbean secondary school is actually written by Hilary Beckles and Vereen Shepherd, and Hilary Beckles is now one of the guess, world-renowned proponents of reparations, and Vereen Shepherd actually leads the reparations research center based at the University of the West Indies. And the same university is led by now Hilary Beckles, so you can see that there is a particular, I guess, cottage industry of Caribbean history. And in secondary school, we are just taught out of the books written by these people, and they have a very particular view and bias that's not really well reflected in history. So, of course, we learn a lot about slavery and slave period, but we learn almost nothing. About the British Empire post 1930, and that's quite surprising when you say it out loud. I'm really interested, Rashid, to hear you say that the standard history is partly written by Hilary Beckles. I've not read that, but as you'll know in my book, I spend a whole section dissecting Hilary Beckles' other book, Britain's Black Debt, which is a book-length argument in favour of reparations. And I have to say, having analysed that book, I wouldn't trust a thing Hilary Beckles says about history. So it's not that he all the facts he says are untrue, but the way he construes them is so selective, so biased, and so lacking in rigour. Generally speaking, I wouldn't. I certainly couldn't trust the history of anything he wrote alone. I'd have to go and check against other histories. Yes, exactly. So you can imagine the 
default perception of most Caribbean people that at least did Caribbean history in secondary school in my generation and now below, they have because they've been taught by these particular textbooks written by Beckles and Shepard, and that is the received wisdom. So I want to begin where I think most people will find the deepest contention, which is to quote you on page 7 of your book. The British Empire cannot be equated with slavery since during the second half of the empire's life imperial preference was consistently committed to abolishing it. Of course, most people equate British Empire and the slavery system, but you are saying, yes, that part is true, but the other part is also true. So could you dissect what you're trying to explain here? So I think when considering the role of the British or the Europeans in general in slave trading and slavery, we've got to put this in context. And one context is the fact that slavery and slave trading were universal phenomena practiced by people of every skin color on every continent. Long before Europeans got involved in slave trading between West Africa and I think Portugal or the Canaries and then the Americas in the mid 1400s, West Africans had been raiding and enslaving and trading other Africans to the Romans and then to the Arabs for centuries. And in North America in the 1700s, the Comanche, the Native American people, the Comanche, ran a vast slave economy. You'll find slavery all over the world. And yes, the kind of slavery that was practiced in the Caribbean was in, in human terms amongst the worst, granted. But slavery is universal. So the fact that Brits were involved in it, excuse me, in fact some Brits, as far as I know, my people had nothing to do with it, but perhaps some Brits were involved in trading and using slave labor was not extraordinary in terms of history. That's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is, therefore, it's very odd indeed, in fact, it's really dubious to focus on the fact that the British were involved in slave trading and slavery without paying attention to that context or without paying attention to the fact that the British, alongside the French and the Danes, were among the first peoples in the history of the world to repudiate this abhorrent practice. The French did it first of all in the 1790s, but then Napoleon reversed that. The Danes abolished the trade in 1804, the British followed in 1807. But then after winning the war against Napoleon in 1815, the British then devoted themselves to trying to persuade other countries, including Brazil, including the US, to stop slave trading. And the British used their imperial power from Brazil to New Zealand, right across Africa, for the next century and a half to suppress slavery. You can only identify colonialism with slavery if you abstract the period 1650 to 1800 from a world context and you forget about everything that happened since. It doesn't make sense. Yes, it's a very selective, it's a very clear bias. It depends on who tells the story. Now, there's clearly a good reason why it's important for people in Britain to have a more reflective view of the empire's past, especially the empire's past benefits on the world. But what do you think is missing when, let's say, people in the Caribbean, for example, have such a viscerally negative reaction when it comes to British empire and their own history? So I think what's missing, and let's be clear, Rashid, most British people nowadays know nothing about it. That's one reason why radical BLM, Black Lives Matter, decolonizing narratives like the equation of colonialism with slavery have taken root here really very fast in the last couple of years. People don't know anything about it. But in terms of people in Barbados or the Caribbean and colonialism, it's the same with the Irish and British Empire. Naturally, you focus on your immediate experience of the empire, or at least from what you tell me, you focus on one half of it. I think what my book will do for the reader is, is to place particular experiences, whether the Irish or to some extent the enslaved Africans in the Caribbean, in a much larger context. The empire lasted 400 years, and it stretched from Newfoundland to New Zealand. And the motives for it vary from person to person, from time to time. It's very hard to generalize in the way that Henry Beckles does, for example. And I hope for two things at least from a reader reading my book. One is that they will learn the whole truth about the British imperial past and also be able to put their own particular national experience into a much larger context. Yes, the British were involved in enslaving Africans and driving slaves on plantations in Barbados in the 1700s. But yes, 
the British were also the first in the world to abolish the damn thing. And for example, to take another example, between May 1940, when France fell to Nazi Germany, and June 1941, when the Germans unwisely invaded the Soviet Union, the British Empire, including some people from the Caribbean, offered the only military opposition to the massively murderous racist regime in Nazi Berlin, with the sole exception of Greece. At least those two things, anti-slavery, anti-Nazism will suggest that the record of the empire is a lot more mixed than, as it were, a myopic focus on slavery in the Caribbean in the 1700s would give you. One of the most important speeches that always comes to mind in this conversation, which I'm sure you know of, is by V.S. Naipaul in his speech called Our Universal Civilization. As a Trinidadian-born writer that lived most of his life in London, Obviously, he had a quite very many opinions about the history of empire and the Caribbean. But one of the things he emphasized, call it the grandiose nature of the empire, was that for people of different cultures and small places, they had the ability to access one large space, one large civilization, or to use more bland terms, one large, you know, social economic venue. However, after the fall of the empire, the disintegration created what in some ways was just a balkanization of very small states, the very insular civilizations that don't actually interact as much now as they did before along some dimensions. So to put it concretely, I am Barbadian. I have a Barbados passport. Now compare me to someone from Martinique who is still a French citizen. And they have a European passport. Now, in just that simple example, I'm from an independent country with all the ideas of the symbolic freedoms and, and so on, but yet I am much more constrained in the world than someone from Martinique, who is still part of France, and still part of the European Union. So they can exercise their talent in the world way easier than I can. So some would say, oh, but, you know, Barbados is better off, but they use the kind of Nepal framing, we actually lost a lot of the universality of the world because the British Empire fell towards the end of the 1960s. That's really interesting, Rashid. So it's not dissimilar to the situation of Britain having left the European Union. I didn't vote for that, although I'm not unhappy with Brexit because I think the European Union is problematic. But we gained certain kinds of autonomy, but lost other kinds of opportunities. I guess one thing to say about independence is it's never absolute. No state is absolutely independent. We all depend on others in various ways to some extent. And some kinds of independence that, let's say, Barbados got involve the loss of opportunities, the loss of freedom. So you can't walk into Europe in the way that a Martinican could. So that's one point. Second point is, I think you're right. One of the virtues of an overarching imperial authority is it can encompass a wide range of different peoples and cultures. And when it's effective, it can prevent conflict between those different peoples and cultures or control conflict. When an imperial authority implodes, or when it's weak, you end up with friction between different peoples. There was an occasion in Southern Africa in the 1880s, the British had invaded Zululand and broken the power of the Zulu Kingdom. And when they left, they disintegrated the Zulu Kingdom into about 11 different mini kingdoms, one ruled by a white man, the rest by Zulu. And after a while, some of the Zulu chieftains were heard to complain. And they said, when you British invaded us and conquered us, you got the right to rule. We get that. We accept the right of conquest. We did that to other people too. You did it to us. Fine. You get to rule. Would you please now do it? Because what you've done is you came in, broke us up, and then you left. Consequently, we're all squabbling. We need an overarching pure authority to moderate our conflicts. The third point is because the British Empire from about uh, 1846 until just after the First World War, 1919 or thereabouts, championed free trade. It did mean that uh, peoples from all parts of the world could visit Britain, could move to other parts of the empire. And, and of course, the reason that people like V.S. Naipaul, who is ethnically Indian, ends up in Trinidad is because of indentured labor signed up in India, brought to the West Indies to work in various forms, I imagine, on plantations, among other things. That did give all sorts of people's opportunities they would never have had without, as it were, the right of free movement throughout the empire. And when you become, in a certain sense, an independent state and you lose kind of integral connection to France or Britain, or any other imperial power, then, of course, you suffer the loss of certain kinds of freedom. 
to extend that point a little deeper, there is an essay by a Trinidadian poet and essayist named Andre Bagu. He wrote an essay called The Free Colony, which was in a larger collection called The Undiscovered Country. And in it, he made the argument that the path for the Caribbean should not have been independence which he calls isolationism. What should have happened was that the Caribbean were fully integrated into the UK and have the right to name the UK Prime Minister, participate in Westminster, save any other UK constituency. But the problem was, of course, a problem of race. It's a very deep racial tension at the time. And the idea that black people will be integrated into the UK Parliament was seen as a bit more farcical, even though I see would argue that would have been the correct direction. Now, of course, in 2023, looking at the current makeup of the UK Parliament, it's almost ironic because it seems like we would have gotten there at some point in the future, <laughs> which we are now, that race is no longer that big of an issue. So then the push for isolation is now even more absurd, even more farcical looking back now. Yeah, that's really interesting. So there was an article in the London Times, I think, after Rishi Sunak became prime minister, which used the phrase, the empire's revenge. The colonized empire has now got its revenge on Britain by putting one of their own at the top. To which my response is, no, not the empire's revenge. It's the, it's the liberal empire's fulfillment. Of course, in the empire, there were different views as to what the empire should be. Some more liberal, some much less liberal. But there was a liberal vision, and you can find it expressed in the 1820s in India, where all of the three major East India Company ports, Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay were ruled by Scotsmen, by the Scots. Every one of those Scotsmen governing those cities could be found writing in the 1820s, we British, we can't expect to rule India forever. All we can hope to do is to build a sufficiently decent form of government, let Indians take over and leave with grace in the 1820s. And then, partly chastened by the loss of the American colonies in the 1780s, in the 1860s, starting with Canada, progressively, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, become more and more independent. So by 1930, they're virtually independent states within what from 1917 was called the Commonwealth of Nations. Now, yes, all those were white settler colonies, but India, not a white settler colony, was put in the same track in 1919. That wasn't the only vision of empire. There was an attempt in the early 1900s to tighten the cohesion of the empire, make it more centralized, make the Westminster Parliament an imperial parliament. But the likes of Australia and New Zealand and South Africa didn't want that kind of tight cohesion. So the idea of the empire relaxing into an association of independent states bound together by common political traditions and culture began to dominate. The idea of the empire being, as it were, necessarily a, a kind of tight control is simply wrong. And the idea of the empire becoming a kind of family of nations comprising many different cultures of people with common interests did in fact dominate and then triumph. And partly because of that, particularly in the post-war period, as you'll know, Britain has received millions of immigrants from Caribbean, especially from the Indian subcontinent. And yes, when I was growing up in the 1960s, there was racial prejudice that West Indians experienced when they landed in England after the war. But in my lifetime, racial attitudes have become, generally speaking, far more liberal and relaxed. And yes, you're quite right. In Boris Johnson's last cabinet, almost every Secretary of State of a major Department of State was headed by someone with non-white skin from Iraq, from Pakistan, from West Africa, from Ghana, and from India. And now we have an Indian Prime Minister. And you know what the most wonderful thing is? It's completely unremarkable. No one discussed it. People in India discussed it, and maybe British Indians discussed it. But in the mainstream press in Britain, no one made any comment. It was so natural, and that's how it should be. Now, to my mind, the only time in the Caribbean you really hear any discussion of British imperialism or colonialism is in the reparations debate. And of course, this debate has moved from a very obscure academic topic to a very strong political platform for the entire Caribbean, where you have the Caribbean community, or CARICOM, the heads of governments have their own commission that they have agreed to form a working group to lobby the UK 
to pay in various ways reparations to the Caribbean. So it's not surprising that this debate is going on in the Caribbean, but I've been seeing it also get a lot more traction in the UK itself. So I guess I'm wondering from your perspective, why has this reparations debate become more potent in the UK? So before I answer your question, Yoshi, can you just tell me something about that? How controversial among people in Barbados and the Caribbean is this reparations project? Does anyone quarrel with it? Hmm, I'd say the common person on the street does think it's a good idea. That's a shame. It is, yes. Okay, I will tell you why I think it doesn't make sense in a moment. But to answer your question, why has it got traction? I think the last time I noticed about a month ago, CARICOM was reported as being about to or having made a claim against European nations for reparations amounting to $31 trillion. I think that was the figure. Why has it got traction? It hasn't got a whole lot of traction just yet. It's been talked about. If we have a Labour government in power in a year's time, I predict we'll get more traction, partly because most of Hilary Beckel's chapters in his book, Britain's Black Debt, starts off with a quotation by a Labour Party minister or a Labour Party shadow minister or Labour Party politician. So clearly that book was directed at the Labour Party for political reasons. Why has it got traction? For two reasons. One is the notion that British colonialism was a litany of racism and oppression and exploitation has got traction in many of our institutions. Again, partly, as I said before, because most people know nothing about it. And because I think most people suffer from a form of liberal guilt. We assume we're guilty. <laughs> Particularly if non-white people tell us we're guilty, we assume we're guilty. But also, I think what's happened is that since the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in the US in, in May 2020, Black Lives Matter in the US had an upsurge of support and influence that came across the Atlantic. And we've swallowed its premises without much critical filtering. Lots of people assume that Britain is systemically racist, notwithstanding the skin color of most of the government under Boris Johnson, as you pointed out. And they are susceptible to the claim, this is all because of our colonial history, which was all about colonialism and slavery. And therefore, sure, we must be guilty and we need to make amends because that's what good people do, don't they? They apologize and make amends. To which my response is, yes, good people apologize and make amends for things they're responsible for, <laughs> not for things they're not responsible for. So that's why it's got traction. Do you mind if I explain why I think reparations makes no sense? Sure, of course. Okay. There are four parts to my argument. You've heard bits of them already. We need to put slavery in the Caribbean in context. At the time, everyone was doing it, okay? Black Africans had been involved in slave trading for centuries. A footnote to that is, I think it's a practical certainty that some of those young men captured and slaved and transported to the West Indies had themselves been involved in slave raids. It's just that fortune had turned on them and the capturer ended up being captured. That doesn't excuse what happened to them, but just to complicate the, the picture. So there was that. So if you're going to ask for reparations, you need to demand it fairly. What about asking Nigeria for reparations? Because they're the inheritors, they're the descendants of people who were involved in slave trading or slavery quite as much as some Britons were. Uh, that's the, the first point. Second point is really odd, isn't it, to demand reparations for slavery from one of the first countries in the world's history to abolish the thing? And then if you think Britain has a black debt, what do the peoples of the world, what do the freed slaves of the world owe to Britain for 150 years of anti-slavery activity? In the 1820s and 30s, the slave trade department, meaning the anti-slave trade department, was the largest unit in the British Foreign Office. In about 1840-50, over 13% of the Royal Navy's total manpower was stationed off West Africa to stop slavery. One economist has reckoned that in the 50 or so years from 1817 to 67, the British spent as much suppressing slavery just across the Atlantic as they will have earned in profits from slavery in the 50 years leading up to the abolition of the trade in 1807. So there's a credit sign as well to debit here. And then the final point is this. Now between 1807, when the slave trade was abolished, or 1833, when slavery was abolished, and the present is almost two centuries. An awful lot's happened in that period. Uh, whatever causal connection between slavery and the condition of Barbadians now has been complicated by all manner of factor. And I think these statistics are significant. According to World Bank data 2020, in terms of life expectancy, literacy, and gross national income in international dollars, Barbados was far better off than Nigeria. So in other words, the, the descendants of slaves in Barbados, for whatever reason, are far better off than the average descendant of slave traders and enslavers in Nigeria. That's just to say, 
an awful lot has happened. The condition of Barbadians now is not all due to slavery, and it's quite hard to pick out the causal connections. So for all those reasons, I think reparations doesn't make sense. What does make sense is Britain remains one of the wealthiest, most prosperous countries on earth, and we have an historic connection with Barbados and the West Indies, parts of the West Indies. We are a major donor of development aid. We can't save the whole world, but when it comes to choosing whom we aid, we have a good historical reason to help the citizens of Barbados than we have to help the citizens of China. So by all means, let's give aid. And in case that sounds patronizingly charitable, of course, let's give aid in ways that Barbadians want us to give aid. Let, let it be consensual and let there be a dialogue, but let us use our resources to help, but not reparations, is my view. Yeah, I agree with that view. I think this actually, to me, a fatal conceit in the reparations debate in the Caribbean. So the CARICOM, a Caribbean community, has this 10-point plan, which they are not only asking for cold, hard cash. I mean, they are asking for money, but not only that. They're asking for these auxiliary things. They're asking for things like help with public health crises, help with the reading programs in Caribbean to increase literacy, help to build more cultural institutions in the Caribbean so that people in Caribbean can learn more about African culture and language and history, you know, things like that. But implicit in this plan seems to be a thing that isn't spoken about enough. If you take a, a, say, a Schrossian interpretation of it, it seems like you're saying we are actually, we, meaning Caribbean, we were wrong for leaving the UK. We actually want the things we left behind anyway. So for example, if I was a UK citizen resident, I will have easy access to all the NHS, all of the different museums, all the archives, all of the African history stuff in the UK. And I would have all these things as a British national. So it would have been if the Caribbean was integrated into the UK, as some people had argued. So they're asking for these things at post, but they're firmly under a reparations debate. That to me is a, a little, a little bit sneaky. That's really interesting. Because all the things they're asking for, the reasonable things to ask for, do help us. To which I say, yes, let's see how we can help. That's totally fine. But that's separate from reparations. Because reparations, I would have thought, if we're supposed to, as it were, tone for slavery, I would thought the way we do that is by reparations being repair. So there must be some debt which you can quantify that Britain now has to meet. But that's not the way, apart from your report, the way it's actually being put. That's been put in a more open-ended fashion. I think there's a bit, bit of equivocation there as to what quite is being asked for. And as for, yes, what's being asked for would have been possible if the West Indies had been part of the people, when I say the West Indies, the British parts of the West Indies had been part of the UK. That's right. It reminds me of, of the case of Ireland, in which I lived for four years in the early noughties. One consequence of the form of independence that the Republic of Ireland eventually got was in some ways tragic because Britain and Ireland are very close neighbours. We are in all sorts of ways integrated and the borders between us remain blurred. So that I was just speaking to someone earlier this week who was a, used to command the British Regiment of the Royal Irish Rangers and lots of citizens from the Republic of Ireland served in the British Army, would you believe? And we all sorts of ways in which British and Irish identity is actually blurred. But one of the consequences of the Republic of Ireland becoming independent of Britain and the empire was that the, the kind of welfare state and, in particular, national health service that Britain adopted after the Second World War, Ireland never adopted, partly because by itself it could never afford it. The level then of social insurance and welfare provision Irish people lost out on. Now, nowadays, of course, Ireland is relatively wealthy, and that problem may have been overcome. But by the way, Ireland's economy took off when Ireland became integrated into the EU, <laughs> not when Ireland was trying to do it alone. Its economy languished until the 1990s. And there is another thing that Beckles leaves off quite often, almost too ironic to bring up sometimes, but he says that the British Empire made the Caribbean worse off, more poor. But he never does the counterfactual to ask what would happen if the Caribbean stayed in the British Empire. And you can kind of do that by looking at the current British overseas territories, which are colonies by different name in many ways, Cayman, Bermuda, BVI, so on. And they're actually better off than the independent Caribbean. Is that right? Okay. Interesting. Yeah, similarly for the French Caribbean, you know, they are better off than Barbados and other Caribbean countries. Puerto Rico is, of course, better off than Jamaica, 
and they never realize what they're actually saying, and they never try to make this point in a concrete way that, well, you have to compare the independent Caribbean countries with the dependent Caribbean countries, but they, they never try to make the argument in a very concrete way. When he says better off, I mean, the obvious question is better off than what? I am saying better off. Say, because, for example, like, for example, GP per capita in Cayman Islands is much higher than Barbados, so on and so on, Martinique, and so on. When Beckles says that the British Empire underdeveloped, underdeveloped implies compared to what? Exactly, that's the point. He never makes a counterfactual argument. He always says underdeveloped, but compared to what? Based on what? He never makes anything concrete. In the chapter on economics in my book, I don't consider the economies of West Indies in detail. I focus more on Africa, Australia, and India. And my impression is that the integration of British colonies into a worldwide imperial free trade situation did give opportunities. For example, and Titanka Rai, the Bengali-born economic historian at the London School of Economics will confirm this, that, for example, it enabled Indian industrialists or entrepreneurs to come to England, send their kids to Cambridge, observe industrial processes in Manchester, then take back expertise and technology to India and build, in the 1890s, build textile mills and steel mills that made India, by the 1930s, a major world producer of steel. And the company, the, the family that, that did that, in the Tata family, they now own most of British steel. So in that case, free trade gave enterprising peoples in various parts of the empire, not white peoples, opportunities they, they never had before. And I suppose that would have been true for people in, in Barbados and the West Indies too, in principle. And as for underdevelopment, the idea of the state being involved in economic development was a very late one. It wasn't until after the Second World War or thereabouts that became normal or at least became the dominant idea. And it was after the Second World War, the British state became much more actively engaged in deliberate economic development of colonies in Africa, and I imagine in the West Indies, but it was late. But then the idea that the state, that was the state's business, was a very late in coming, even in Britain. No doubt, if that idea had become more common and accepted decades before, there would have been more development in the West Indies. The idea wasn't dominant, and it came late. But when it came, I imagine the West Indies in the 1950s did benefit from deliberate economic development policies. So the question of underdevelopment, you've got to ask in comparison to what? I mean, and if, if you're imagining some counterfactual, we can all do that. But I find counterfactual scenarios really unhelpful because we can imagine a whole different set of circumstances where Barbados became an economic powerhouse, but it doesn't help because you've got to deal with Barbados as it actually was and is. Given those circumstances, what was possible? I've not read the book, but as you can tell, I'm skeptical. And it sounds like you are too. Yes, I'm very skeptical about it as well. See, Beckel's argument rests on, let's say, a very incurably Marxist perspective. And that's his orientation, which he admits himself in the books. But on this Marxist axiom, they have a very particular view that capital is the foundation of growth, which is just not true. So they believe that if you take capital of the Caribbean, somehow ipso facto, fill in the blanks, magic happens, therefore the Caribbean is underdeveloped from Britain. But of course, the real things that push growth is talent, institutions, is management, is ideology, is capacity, all these larger concepts. So there is a point made by Dr. Delal Worrell in a recent book of his, where he made the argument by his estimates in the growth data that in Barbados, the bulk of the growth we have now actually came in 1950s and 60s and 70s. The further you got away from British administration, the less growth you had in Barbados. And he made a point that because the institutions do really matter. That's his argument. That's really interesting. So first of all, it just occurs to me for what you said, that of course, Beckles is really recycling the argument of Eric Williams and his 1940 Capitalism and Slavery Marxist. And just to say that, although Beckles won't tell you this, at least didn't, doesn't say to the reader in his book, the claim that you can attribute that very largely or significantly to profits from slave plantations in, and slave trading in the West Indies is highly controversial, and most economists don't believe it. Yes, I think the kind of moderate, settled opinion or consensus settles around the view that yes, slave trading and slavery did make a contribution to Britain's prosperity, but far more important were technological developments in England itself. So the idea that 
Beckles does propagate that somehow the wealth of Britain is built on the backs of slaves in the West Indies is far too exaggerated. And yes, there are some Marxists who continue to push that line, but lots of economic historians are deeply skeptical about it. And yes, one of the reasons that, that the likes of Australia which was, it was a fairly late colony, 1788 was the first landing. But by 1880, I read, which really shocked me, Australia was the most prosperous country in the world. Now, why was that? One reason given by David Fieldhouse in his standard work on colonial economics was that partly institutions, partly political culture, which meant that the Australian government balanced its budgets, its institutions of law were reliable, which encouraged investment. And the other factor was that the people came to Australia were entrepreneurs. So investment, entrepreneurs, stable institutions, yes, you need capital, but then stable institutions and enterprise attract capital. So it's not just capital. Yes, exactly. And in his most recent book, the one I mentioned, How Britain Underdeveloped the Caribbean, that's a very odd intellectual move, in my opinion where he quotes a lot of Arthur Lewis in a particular chapter about economics arguments for his point. But he does very early, early Lewis, and especially his first major work. It's not that major in any respect. And he quotes him a lot from that original book. But he quotes almost nothing, especially nothing from later Lewis, where we actually think of Arthur Lewis' work and model and growth theory and so on, where he missed a lot about foreign investment and proper talent and capacity and so on. Beckles makes no utility of later Lewis, only the very, very first 1930s Lewis. And it's a very strange thing to do if you're going to make a concrete point for economics of reparations. When Lewis made that point about the necessity of British state aid, what period is he talking about? It was published in 1939, I believe. I don't know about the West Indies in this regard. Certainly I know that in terms of Africa, that was a, about the time when it was post-war, when the, partly because Britain was aware that its colonies were going to move to some kind of independence, and also partly because of the experience of the war, because the experience of the war, of course, meant that the state, because of an emergency, played a much bigger part in all, all sorts of life and in the economy. And after the war, there was the view that the state needs to play a much larger part in provision welfare. So the role of the state was enhanced by the Second World War. And it was then that the idea that Britain needs to provide resources for economic development began to take off. So I'm surprised that I would have expected that some of that would have gone to the West Indies. Now, I've talked already about why it didn't happen earlier. And that part of the reason is that for most of history, the primary role of the state was to maintain law and order. And it didn't have resources. It didn't have lots of resources for welfare purposes. That was a post-war innovation. I wanted to ask from a last question, if there was any particular explicit theoretical ethical framework you used when you were considering the arguments you made in the book. Yes, Rashid, so I put my moral cards on the table in the introduction, and there's a, a section there where I say, no, I'm a, a Christian, and I lay out my ethical views. And of course, telling you I'm a Christian doesn't tell you a whole lot about what I think ethically, because lots, lots of different Christians think different things. And besides, what Christians think is not very different from other. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I am joined by Nigel Bigger, Professor Emeritus of Moral Theology at the University of Oxford. On this episode, we had a conversation centered on his most recent book, Colonialism, A Moral Reckoning. I greatly enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. Professor Bigger, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. My pleasure, Rashid. Uh, Glad to be here and uh, have a chance to chat about some important things. I came across your book for the first time a few months ago, and I finished reading it maybe a week or so after I bought it. And I was stunned because this is such an important book. And it is surprising for the fact that this is not the most popular argument to be made these days in the academy as an understatement. As to my knowledge, the only person I remember making a similar book length argument recently was Bruce Gilley. So I'm curious, why did you decide to write this book at this time? Yeah, Rashid, I'm glad that when you heard about the book, you were keen to read it because lots of people who hear about it are not keen to read it. (laughs) So frankly, I wanted to write this book for political reasons. There was a local reason here in the UK, namely in 2014, we had a referendum on whether Scotland should separate itself from the UK. And I'm Anglo-Scottish and I'm an instinctive unionist, anti-secessionist. I think the UK is a valuable multinational state. 
But I, I felt obliged to look at the arguments made by secessionists as to why Scotland should become independent. And one argument I came across was this. Britain equals empire equals evil, and for Scotland to break from the UK, for Scotland to cleanse itself of grubby, morally compromised imperial past, and to sail off into some new, bright, shiny, sin-free, probably European future. And since I'd spent 30 years off and on reading about British imperial history, I knew that the simplistic equation, empire equals evil, just ain't true. But that was the point at which I realized that colonial history has political power, and in this case was being used to support a cause that I regarded as, and still regard as, politically delusory and destructive. But more generally, I think, as I say in the book, that the interesting focus of a lot of folk on the left with European and British colonialism, not Chinese or Arab or Zulu or Comanche, but British colonialism, that's interesting because it's selective. And why is it selective? I think because the British Empire is a proxy for the West, and the record of the empire is the record of the West. And what's going on here is is an assault on the record of the West. And since I regard the West, we can talk about what that means, but I regard the West as worth defending, notwithstanding its many faults, and there are many things about the West of which I'm critical. Because I regard the West as worth defending, I wanted, again, to explain the much more nuanced and morally ambiguous story about the British Empire. For me, growing up in the Caribbean, I was obviously exposed to a very particular view of the British Empire and a very particular view of co 